We're honored today to have with us our museum executive director, Chris Derby. Most everybody here knows Chris. Chris has been with the museum more than three years now. And Chris is passionate about vehicles of all types, whether it be classics, supercars, hypercars, imports, military, helicopters, tanks, dirigibles, whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, yeah. uh, Chris has been wonderful to have my vehicle team at the museum. Uh, he's an inspiration for us all. Uh, and he, uh, when I said we need to do something on tractors, and Chris goes, I'm the guy. So, um, Chris, uh, let's give Chris a warm welcome. And here we are to I'll apologize in advance. I'm getting over a respiratory thing. I'm not contagious, I promise, but I'm coughing a lot. So just bear with me if I start coughing, please. Um, it's been a real honor for the past almost three years to be here. The team here, Sherry and Doug and all of our frontline staff, Nick, our mechanic, make my job and make me look very good. And it's a great thing to be on a team that's that passionate about what we do every day. Doug said, you know, about me doing the tractors, I tend to do the weird ones. I like the niche things, I like the cars and the vehicles, like tanks, that, not the dirigibles though, that <laughs> tell a strange story, that are some unique part of the history. That's why I did the Hutmobile, that's why I did the power wagon, and that's why I wanted to do the tractors. I'm a farm kid from southern Illinois. My family's had the same farm since 1848. We're going to be one of the very first bicentennial farms in that state. So farming comes naturally to us. In fact, we own what may be one of the earliest John Deere plows in the world today. So. John Deere hasn't been able to confirm it yet, but we've been working with them because that's what family lore says it is. But tractors speak to me. I grew up driving tractors, running around the farm, helping, probably hindering more than I helped, but really working on helping. And so when we were able to get this Lamborghini tractor, I was extremely thrilled. And we may end up eventually buying a couple more tractors. And you'll see why as we go through today's story, hopefully. This was the hardest talk I've ever done to decide on a title. What do you talk about? You know, you've got three distinct parts of my talk today. The first part is about Ferruccio Lamborghini and his story, and how he starts making tractors and then cars. Well, you've got to talk about the cars a little bit. You've got to talk about his tractors. You've got to talk about the competition. You've got to talk about his feud with Enzo Ferrari. And you've got to talk about what tractors are making today. So it's, it's a very interesting and unique area to be talking about. So tractors and cars, cars and tractors, and the feud. We're going to be talking about the Trattori, the Lamborghini Tractor Company, Sour Grapes and the feud, what caused him and Enzo Ferrari to go head to head. How much of a, what most people aren't going to realize before this is how much of an entrepreneur and industrialist. In the beginning, Ferruccio Lamborghini was born on 28th April 1916 and died 20th of February 93. He had a good long life. In his early years, his parents were great farmers. And that would be a key factor in his life, both at the beginning and the end, because let's face it, Ferruccio hated grape farming. He wanted, to do anything, he wanted to do anything but grape farming after he grew up, and his dad wanted to leave him the business for him to raise the grapes for him. From an early age, he had a very deep interest in the mechanical, engineering, mechanics, building, what makes things work, how to make it better. Early in his career, he ends up going to primary school, and after he graduates from that, he does not follow his parents into the great business, but goes on to another school that teaches him mechanics. He ends up being um, apprenticed, if you will, after he graduates with his certification and license by a master blacksmith who teaches him metallurgy, he teaches him welding, and a lot of skills that'll play well into him in the future. He then, at the ripe age of 18, starts his own mechanics business in his home community there. And it's, it's through this that he, he develops a lot of his love of it. And then a little thing like World War II came along and kind of ended his dreams for a little while. He gets, ends up being drafted into the Italian military and becomes a mechanic for him. He's working on airplanes, he's working on tanks, he's working on trucks and cars. He ends up on the Isle of Rhodes out in the Mediterranean where he's doing all this. He becomes so good at it, the, the head commander of the Isle of Rhodes forces makes him his personal mechanic. He lets him mess with his car, do brakes and different things. Well, as the, German, as the Italians decide to surrender and the Germans are, are coming in, 
almost the entire Italian army and Air Force forces on roads flee. Ferruccio decides not to. He stays put. He decides he's going to make the best out of it, opens a mechanic shop, and the Germans are so happy with his work that they don't arrest him. He meets his future wife. They get married and then move back to Italy where he opens a shop. This shop he opens in Pieve di Cento. He modified an old Fiat Topolino. Ferruccio was never happy with the quality and the speed of the cars that, that he would get, so he'd always improve things. He if, then goes on and uses his mechanical abilities to modify a city car into a Mila Miglia racer and is doing very, very well. He's up in the, I think he's even leading the race when at 1,100 kilometers he runs into a restaurant. Not to eat, he totals the car. So that kind of ended that. In 1947, remember, this is the end of World War II. We, the Americans and the Brits and the French, are trying to take care of ourselves. We're licking our wounds, trying to get back on track. Italy switched sides at the very end of the war, but weren't really part of the Allies. Nobody really trusted them. And Germany's trying to take care of itself and get back on its feet. So there is a massive shortage of farm equipment and tractors in Italy that cannot be helped. So what he does is he starts buying up used, cheap military surplus vehicles and converting them into tractors. Starting out predominantly with gasoline engines, a lot of them were Morris engines, 3500 cc. He starts building tractors and these become extremely, extremely popular among the, the Italian farmers in the region. So they're coming over, looking at them, trying them out and buying them. Well, pretty soon he's making enough of the Carioca, the, the, peop, the farmer's tractors, that he realized in 48 he needs to form a company and start making his own. So in 1948, he forms Lamborghini Trattori, Lamborghini Tractor Corporation, and starts producing, and they're making about 150, 200 tractors a year at the first. But during this time, he's bought these Morris engines. He starts tinkering with them, and suddenly he's able to buy himself a license to produce domestically his own engines on the design of Morris. And so he starts doing that, which was very fortunate because as things continue, um, the Italian government makes a change in their laws to promote the use of domestically built and produced agricultural equipment. Huge tax incentives to the buyers, to the manufacturers. Ferruccio is already on top of the game because he's making his own Lamborghini motors. He's making his own tractors now, all the parts. And he continues to grow and develop. By 1950, he's actually having to mortgage his father's grape farm to buy 10,000 square meters, if I remember right, yeah, 10,000 square meters of farmland that used to have a racetrack on it to build a bigger factory. And for the foreseeable future, he's building onto that factory very, very quickly. And by the mid-50s, he's producing 25 to 30 tractors a day. They become the most popular 50s uh, Italian tractor series. He also engineered and built a fuel atomizer. Now, why is this important? Well, Ferruccio, as he's building out his empire and his industrial empire, realizes that it's much cheaper to run on diesel, but they don't have an efficient way to start the diesels. So the fuel atomizer allows his diesel motors to start off on gasoline, and once it's running, switch over to the much, much cheaper diesel because road gas was way too expensive and diesel was pennies on the dollar compared. So this is a vital part because it makes his tractors more attractive. They don't have to use much gas. They can use the diesel to get them going and to do the farming. And so he continues to grow. He continues to expand. He gets his father's farm out of the, the bank's hands very quickly and continues to grow. His growing success allowed him to secure several very nice vehicles. He ended up buying Alphas, Lanchas, a Mercedes-Benz SL300, I think it was the Roadster, not the Gullwing, a Jaguar E-Type, and two Maserati 3500 GTs. In 58, he traveled to Maranello to buy his first Ferrari, a 250 GT by Pininfarina. He buys several more, including a Scaglietti 250 GT, an SWB Berlinetta, and a 250 GT 2 Plus 2. He stated the cars were good, but too noisy and rough to be proper road cars. 
He had categorized them as repurposed track cars with poor interiors. So this probably, if this was a public statement, didn't go over too well with Enzo Ferrari. Well, it gets worse. Lamborghini, the Ferraris of the time had a known problem with the clutches. Ferruccio got tired of having to drive his all the way back to Marinello to the factory to have the clutches rebuilt and repaired. So he finally hands the keys to one of his 250s over to his lead tractor mechanic at the factory and says, fix it. Well, he using, using tractor clutch parts and other things, the, the mechanic engineers a new working, reliable clutch system for the car. And that results in Ferruccio being rightly proud and trying to talk to Enzo Ferrari about it, telling him, I've got a fix for your, default of cl your defective clutches. Let's work something out. Well, if you've seen Ford versus Ferrari or other movies about the feud, you know, he fought with Ford, he fought with Lamborghini, he fought with about everybody, I think. He just was, I don't want to say typical Italian, but you got two typical Italian hotheads going at it here pretty quick. For, uh, Ferrari is noted to have said, you may be able to drive a tractor, but you'll never be able to handle a Ferrari properly. And then he topped it off with, let me make cars, you stick to making tractors. So the war is on. Ferruccio gets mad, 1963 starts developing his first car, the 350 GT, which he brings out in 64, and it's a success. It's a very nice performing car, it's got reliable, it's got performance, everything everybody wanted. So he starts selling those too and makes Lamborghini automotive. The other thing to know about Lamborghini is he was a huge aficionado of bullfighting. If you look at what he called his cars, they're all named, almost all of his, almost all Lamborghini cars are named after famous fighting bulls or fighting arenas. After the 350, you had the 400, then the Uraca, then the Mira, and it keeps going on. Diablo in the 90s, that's named after one of the most famous fighting bulls in history. Uraca was one of the stadiums, as I recall. And so if you look back through the history, the names come from, from his love of bullfighting. He brings that into the, to the, Logos as well. Everybody knows what Ferrari has, the prancing pony, right? Do you know why Lamborghini chose the bull? Or why he stated he chose the bull? He said, because the pony is scared of the bull. So it's another bleep you to Enzo Ferrari, basically, in the end. Now, part of his empire of industry, Ferruccio in 1959 takes a trip to the US, and he is extremely excited about a fairly new burner technology, gas burner technology for heating and air conditioning systems. So he comes back to Italy, he's building tractors, he's just a few years short of building cars, and comes out with one of the most advanced systems in Europe for HVAC, heating, air conditioning, ventilation. So he's making air conditioners and forced air heaters, and it's a huge hit. Now as things continue to grow, and in the late 60s, this, the country of Bolivia decides to order 5,000 tractors on a co-op contract for their farmers. They're expanding, things are going fairly well, and then what happens in Central and South America on a too frequent basis back then? You have a junta, a coup d'etat. The president that ordered the tractors is removed from office, I don't think permanently in this particular case, but he's removed and the new president cancels the contract. Well, they're setting on 5,000 tractors that were already sold, but can't go where they're supposed to go. They didn't get them paid for them. What are we going to do? Well, he ends up pricing them in Europe and around Europe and is able to fill market holes around the, country, around the countries of Europe because people are, ag is growing and growing in importance again. People are looking for better equipment that can get the job done more efficiently and faster. Here he's setting on 5,000 tractors that are ready for an owner. And so in a very short time, he manages to commercially sell all 5,000 throughout Europe, recoup not only the losses, but make a very nice profit that allows him to continue to grow. And a lot of that money apparently is what he used when he went to make the car company because he had so much ready cash. 1971, Ferruccio decides to sell the factory, not the, not the tractor company, but the factory only, to Fiat. And then about that same year, he ends up selling a 51% stake in Lamborghini publicly. It's been a private, close-held corporation up until this time by him. 
And most of that ends up in the same group's inventory of, of prospects. And then by 73, he sells the, the tractor company outright to SAME, who produces tractors going forward. Lamborghini tractors today, they still make tractors. They're part of the SDF group, which includes Lamborghini, Deutz, Deutz Alice, Herleman, Gregoire, a few others. They're still very popular. The, the Lamborghinis are sold in Europe, not in the US typically. There are a few here. Um, one of their national, their national sales manager, I think it was, reached out to me and Doug a couple months ago because he'd seen our Facebook post about owning the tractor and was giving us some additional information. So there are some tractors here they use for testing and things, but almost all of them from SDG group or SDF group in the US now are sold under the Deutz. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, Jeremy Clarkson. How many in here have watched the Clarkson's farm? Nothing is ever good enough for Jeremy. It's gotta be the biggest, fastest, stupidest thing on the planet. And in the very start of series of season one, he won't buy one of the reconditioned used tractors like a normal person in that part of Britain apparently, but imports this monstrosity, all wheel drive, twin turbo from Germany which then leads to more fun because the English attachment setups are not the same as the continental European attachment setups. So then he has to have the tractor modified or buy German spec equipment to attach to it. But he's always good for a laugh. Ferruccio ends up buying an estate near Lake Trisimino in 74. And what does he do? Well, he finds that he's really into hunting. So he starts building a hunting preserve and of all things, farming grapes, which he falls in love with and becomes one of the serious producers in that part of Italy by hiring the world's greatest experts in grape growing and such. He ends up building a golf course on the property, continues to expand the property, and lives out there until he passed away in 93. Now, how many new Porsche made tractors? This part is a bit of an interesting reach on this that I really wanted to do, and the more I dug into it, the crazier this information gets. Starting in 34, Porsche decided they wanted to develop a tractor. Now this is before the Porsche Car Corporation or anything. This is before World War II. 1937, Ferdinand Porsche gets a contract from the Nazis to begin developing the People's Tractor, kind of like the Volkswagen, the People's Car, which he's also heavily involved with, and a lot of their military vehicles as well never really gets off the ground because of the war. 1950, he works a deal with Allgaier and starts production of the, an AP-17 Porsche tractor. He dies in 51. In 56, they end the production of water-cooled tractors going for an air-cooled. In 56, they also start the new models, the green tractors, and just a few years later, in 60, or in 50, six, excuse me, same time, they start the red tractors, which you see here. You've got the Diesel Junior, the Diesel Standard, the Diesel Master, and the Diesel Super. Displacement of motors, power, and speed are what the differences basically are. The, the more fancy, the more expensive, the more horsepower you get. 62, Mannheim AG decides to discontinue production of diesel tractors for Porsche, and in 63, the last is produced. So they had a decent run from for 13 years. They're very sought after and collected tractors. They're very much in line with what the Lamborghinis run today to get one, and there are several out there, even on this side of the pond. In fact, in 2018, Porsche brought out an option for an elect all electric tractor with a huge amount of horsepower. Let me see, seven th or 700 horsepower Mission E tractor. But the one thing you need to notice is the date April 1st of 2018. April Fool's joke from Porsche. <laughs> Ferrari made tractors. Ferrari still makes tractors. Of all the strange things, they're green for the most part. There are some red ones. But Ferrari started producing even before the feud with Lamborghini. 1957, at the Verona Fair, they introduced the model MC57, what we'd really call a, a lawn tractor or a garden tractor but they've continued. They don't produce huge tractors, but for Europe, they're pretty big, decent spec tractors. 70s, they started producing motor mowers, transporters, and agricultural machines for rough terrain. 
1988, Ferrari joined the BCS Group, a major agricultural company in Europe, and they're still producing today. Here's some of the current models listed on their site. Fordson and Ford. We've all heard of Fordson tractors. We've heard of Ford tractors. We hopefully all know that they were part of the Ford Motor Corporation, but believe it or not, they started very early. This is a 1907 Ford prototype, 1907, or Ford Sun prototype. Ford's and tractors, Model F and N, were the highest production uh, tractor in the U.S. Um, they were the only automotive firm to sell cars, trucks, and tractors simultaneously. Or excuse me, 1920, 75% of all tractors built in the U.S. were Fordsons. 39, the tractors were introduced in the 9N, developed with Harry Ferguson, later Massey, or Massey Ferguson, after the Massey Harris collapse. Includes the introduction of a three-point hitch, was designed by Ferguson. So Ferguson was the first one to design our modern three-point hitch. In 53, they introduced the NAA. In 64, European Fords and American Ford tractor brands consolidated globally under Ford tractors. 88 or 86, Ford purchases New Holland. You've all seen the blue New Holland Ford tractors out there. And today, in 91, Ford sold its tractor division, including New Holland, to Fiat. Ford name was allowed to be used by Fiat through 99 to continue U.S. market and to begin the transition. Samson Tractors, a division of General Motors. Anybody heard of Samson? Have a couple of farm fiends out here then. 1916, Samson Iron Works was renamed the Samson Fat Tractor Company, and in 1918, General Motors buys out Samson and Janeville Machine Company. 1919 merged both companies under Samson Tractor Company, and in 1923, Jim closed it down. Not a very long production, not a very big production. It wasn't worth Jim continuing, so they do close it down. But there's some interesting designs here. I, I really especially like the S25 there with the tricycle design. Citroen. 1919, Citroen developed its first tractor, the B2. That little thing right there. They built a hundred of them, but only five or six still exist. They've continued to make tractors on later. There's, I couldn't find hardly any information, but it's another car maker that did and has ventured into the tractor business. I do like the half track design on that one. Mitsubishi tractors. Mitsubishi makes pretty much everything from air conditioners to cars, trucks, tractors, electronics. 1914, Sato Agricultural Machinery is formed. They're making equipment to go with tractors, but they don't make their first tractor till 73. 1980, Sato merges with a division of Mitsubishi. Tractors built in Japan by Mitsubishi are sold around the world by other company names, including Case, Cub Cadet, International Harvester, Kumai, Mahindra, Renault, and Suzu. So they're still making them today. Some of them are Mitsubishis, but that brings up another one. Who can tell me who has made the corporation that has manufactured every John Deere lawn and garden tractor since the 70s? Hint is it's not John Deere. Japanese company by the name of Yanmar has made every single John Deere riding lawnmower, garden tractor, yard tractor for 50 years. Most of us don't realize it. They still have the John Deere quality, but they're not actually made at a John Deere plant. They're made under license. So that includes a lot of this. A lot of this probably falls under um, the Yard Machine logo now, too, because I know they've purchased, MTD's bought out Yard Machine. Um, they bought out um, a lot of the major manufacturers here in the U.S. And they're all made to their standards, no longer to the, to the, to the previous standards, but still a lot out there. Now here's an interesting one. This is one of my very favorites. This is a tractor company that made a car. Minneapolis Moline. It's called the UDLX. And they made between 100 and 150 of these in 38. This is on my hit list. If I can ever convince Doug, we got to get one of these. They're very rare. They're very expensive. But if you look at the continuation, you see you've got a cab. Some, they made a handful less than 10. It was either 5 or 10 in a convertible model. Um, a lot of the ones you'll see that are convertibles are, are retro convertible, not original. So the, convert, the true convertibles are extremely valuable. 
but the UDLX was designed to farm all week, hose it off, and drive your wife and family to church on Sunday. There's a bench seat in there. It's set up properly. You've got windshield wipers. It will do on the road, if I remember correctly, almost 40, 45 mile an hour in road mode. So very interesting attempt. It was a miserable failure, but it is an amazing part of the history of the cars and tractors. International Harvester. We know they started out with farm equipment. As early as 1907, they made an auto buggy, auto wagon, which Doug reminded me we had one in here four years, five years ago, or right after we opened. Very rare, neat pieces. Travel alls, scouts, different carriers. My very favorite is this one. This came out in the early mid 90s. Yes, that is a semi pickup truck. They started the, the base price on it in around 92 or three, if I remember correctly, it was $125,000. It's a four door pickup, step side pickup. Hopefully it has an elevator or at least a rollout ladder so you can climb in. But these were made as pickup trucks and sold through international dealers as pickup trucks. And of course, they're still making Paystars and all the other international truck, tractor trailer combined. They can. Our Lamborghini. What we have right in front of us, the 1R. The thing about our, car, our tractor that is especially interesting is the fact that it's a 1964. And what did I say earlier happened in 64? Lamborghini started making cars. Our tractor is the same year as the first Lamborghini cars. Doug had to go the furthest afield of all of our acquisitions ever to get that. We bought it on Bring a Trailer, but he had to have it imported from Turin, Italy. And it's been well restored. It's, a, it's an agricultural restoration. It ain't perfect. It's not up to, say, the V16 Cadillac and some of our finest cars, but it is in its own right a neat piece. It looks like it's turbocharged. It's not. It's just the air intake system on them has a huge bell at the very front of the tractor behind the grill. It's a 1,462cc air-cooled two-cylinder diesel. It's got a dual range on it, high and low, but it's also got another feature that's pretty interesting. Rather than having a selectable PTO on here, this has two PTO connectors, one on top of the other. You've got your high RPM and your low RPM setting right there together. So you just take the cap off the one you don't want to use, put it on the lower or the upper, it's on the upper right now, to select your, your speed of, of rotation for your PTO. So very interesting feature. Drives nice, I haven't driven it yet, but one of these days I'll take it out in the back parking lot for a little spin. But just really neat tractors, and they're very well built. You gotta remember about the Lamborghini tractors, they were the height of the quality at the time. That's why Ferruccio was so successful. He paid attention to details. He was never satisfied. He's constantly tinkering and constantly coming out with better ways to do it. So that's our, our little tractor there. I do want to thank you for putting up with me. And I'll answer some questions, but that's the end of this. On the uh, uh, tra tractor made with the cab, the, uh, uh, I'll spit it out and go. The Minneapolis. Minneapolis. I think what we uh, felt was the reason it uh, was successful is on there almost double the price of the tractor. So consequently, the farmer said, "I'm not going to." It was cheaper than buying a car and a tractor, but and ladies. At the time weren't really convinced totally to get rid of their horses. No, and ladies, let's be real honest. If you've got a car tractor, how impressed are you to go to church in it? <laughs> Guys think, I'm, you know, my mind, hey, it's a great idea. One thing to kill all our needs, but I would presume that it was mostly the ladies that killed it personally just because they couldn't see themselves pulling up to church in their Sunday finest and stepping out of the back door of a tractor. Because that one, the door is in the back. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm not a tractor, sure. uh, I don't really know nothing about them, but how much, if you know at all, how much did people steal their designs from each other? Because looking at this one, I can't tell the difference, if it, if, it wasn't had, if it didn't have Lamborghini on it, I couldn't tell the difference between a Lamborghini and a Ford. Basically, I think what happened, and this is just my opinion, 
but in the case of design, form followed function. And they found that the general style was the most functional design, and they all built their own renditions of it. The wheels, because of the spacing on agricultural equipment, your wheels have to be pretty standardized, so you're going through the rows, not through the crops. So you've got to keep in mind how far standard spacing is for your rows and put your wheels where those are. But overall, the general layout, I mean, it's, it's motor, it's transmission, you stick a driver on somehow towards the back, and everything works well that way. I mean, again, that's my interpretation. I think it's probably c pretty correct, but form following function here. That's why they got away from the tricycle style as much as anything was the lack of balance. They flip a little easier. So they did it that way. Uh, what would that have cost you? This one here was $1,765, $1,765. Initial, that's manufacturer suggested in 64. Thank you. Did Lamborghini have a lot of patents? A few, as I understand it. I didn't really get into the patent side on my research yet, but he, he held a few for the atomizer, of course, that, that led to his huge success in being able to start with gas and switch to diesel after it started. So, is this four cylinder? Two. 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 <laughs> well, what about all the other tractors you talked about? They ranged. Uh, the earliest tractors were mostly one, two, and I think up to four. Uh, you've got six and eight, and I don't know how many in some of the newest tractors anymore. They, they get huge. I was thinking that John Deere started out with two cylinder. One and two, I think, were usually the first starts, and then it went up. Lamborghini, went, uh, on the 1Rs in the 60s and such, I mean, again, the size of the European tractors are smaller because you're trying to drive them down these itty-bitty little ancient farm roads between the tall hedgerows. What they consider a huge tractor, like Jeremy Clarkson in that picture, is only medium-sized to us here because we've got these huge roads and flat plains in Kansas and Illinois, and you can block the whole thing, making everybody upset, but you got to get your equipment to the field and get done, right? My grandfather in Southern Illinois farmed his entire life and made a living in retirement off of about 1,000 acres. I personally know people farming between 20 and 80,000 acres every year in Illinois and one that's 120,000. And that's all in that black topsoil where they're doing 300 plus bushel of an acre corn. A Little bit of fertilizer, but it's all black top loam where I grew up. Two feet of it. The Jeremy Clarkson being Jeremy Clarkson about that humongous tractor and it wouldn't fit any shit, it was too tall. Yeah. Also didn't have the right right setup on it for for the English farm equipment. But again, that's a medium sized tractor to us. If you set that thing and it's it's a big tractor, it's all wheel drive, turbo twin turbocharged, but if you set that next to the big stuff here, it's tiny. Well, that's a great show, Clarkson's Farm, and you can you can find it if you look for Last it. Last season comes out next month, I believe. Everything he does, he gets in trouble. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but in spite of that, John, he's become one of the greatest spokespeople for British agriculture. The 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 civil authorities absolutely hate him, and with justification, but the farmers and the farm families who have been so battered and bruised over the Brexit, over COVID and everything else, love him because he's speaking their truth. So the anti-hero may be becoming a, a hero to the British farmers. And he's never aimed for that. Yeah. Top speed and horsepower? Uh, horsepower on this one is a whopping 26. And I'm presuming we might get it up to what, 15? Yeah. <laughs> the cars and the tra tractors are at complete polar opposites. Although you get power with both. What's this one work now? These sell in the range of 40 to 50,000. In this condition. Unrestored, running 20, 25, 30. But there aren't a lot of these in the U.S. 
They were never sold directly here. They still mostly aren't. So, you know, if you're a crazy person like me that we've got a Lamborghini car, we have to have a Lamborghini tractor. And I can badger Doug long enough to finally give in to shut me up. Um, you end up with one. But it tells, Doug's philosophy of our collection, I've probably covered this before and I'll probably cover it a thousand times to y'all in the future. It's not just the car. You, most of y'all in this room are gearheads, motor fiends, whatever we want to call ourselves. 90% of the people that come in here aren't. And so we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, those of you that are gearheads are going to be back. You walk in here, you see what we've got, you can't believe that anything like this place is in Manhattan, Kansas. And we are an aberration. We are so much more than anybody expects. But we know you're going to come back. You're going to see that one car or something and wonder what we're up to next. And Doug's always up to something because we want to keep you coming back. But we've got to be able to tell stories. And Doug spends more time, we all do, but especially through Doug's leadership on this, spends more time researching the history from a social, political, world place, corporate, criminal, whatever, women's empowerment, you name it. We collect those stories for the people that aren't gearheads. Because they want you to eventually kind of become maybe sort of a gearhead. But we know you'll come back if we've got the right stories. And the, getting the correct stories, the truthful stories, and everything has it, if you, almost everything has it if you dig far enough. But that's why we have a V16. That's why we have one of one rolls. That's why we have the R34 Skyline Nissan that all the young people go goo goo over. That's why we have a tractor. Because they're interesting stories and they tell a lot more than horsepower, RPM, and top speed. So. Isn't the Lamborghini car in the Volkswagen family? Lamborghini, Bugatti, Porsche. Skoda, Audi, Volkswagen, I'm forgetting a few, I think, Dan, aren't I? All belong to the Volkswagen group, Audi group. When did that, when did that happen? Early 2000s, late 90s. Skoda, the check maker, moved over in the 2000s. Um, Bugatti was a little earlier, I think, 90s before the EB-10, if I remember right. Um, so not, so not Ferrari. No, Ferrari's now part of another group. Is that part of Fiat now? Along with Maserati and Fiat owns a ton of those. Are there, are there any restrictions like to import a, new, a newer Ferrari tractor from it's the U.S. as a as Most likely. Likely. Just like a, any other vehicle, I presume you have to meet emissions and safety and certain other standards. Um, on agriculture, I presume it's a lot lower. I mean, Mahindra, one of the biggest selling tractors here right now, is an Indian corporation that brings in, and they're good tractors. They're on the low end of the price, so they can get a lot of people, but it's not a, you know, you, you've still got to pass through all the safety inspections and approvals like anything else. But that's your, your microwave ovens, your, your cars, your whatever you're getting from whatever part of the world. What was the, uh, basically what was like more immediate impact of uh, the Lamborghinis coming out? When it comes to uh, Lamborghini versus Ferrari, like how much the sales did he take away and all that? He had a, a significant impact on it. I, it was, it's been several weeks since I read that statistic and I don't remember off the top of my head, but it definitely made a dent in Ferrari. Um, personally, as a child of the 80s, um, there, we had a saying and we all had the Countach up on our walls, but the saying even back then, and I, pre, I personally believe it today is, those that have money and want you to know they've got money by a Lamborghini, those with a clue by a Ferrari. And having driven some of each, the Ferraris drive much better, they're more comfortable. I like them a lot better, but to each their own. One last thing here. I spent some time in southern France uh, in 2000. 
out in the wheat producing portion of the country, all I saw was John Deere and combines. And they had very short headers on the combines because the roads aren't like that. John Deere. Deere's number one in Europe. However, they're not number one in any one country. No. JCB's the huge big name over there for equipment. Um, that's what I refer to as the caterpillar of Europe. I mean, they really are caterpillars dominant place in Europe versus caterpillar here and elsewhere. Um, it's, there are just, there's so many tractor companies and different equipment companies that you can't do all of them. I just tried, like I said, to stick with a car connection tractor, or a tractor connection car, but yeah, they, the people over there buy whatever they can get their hands on that's going to do the best for them at the best price and the most reliable. Efficiency is everything as we know to our farmers. That's it. Thank you all very much.